Alex has already um, described the uh, sort of disappearance and reemergence of famine, if you will. I think it might be interesting to start off just a little bit of a timeline. Um, Alex mentioned the great famines in the Horn of Africa in the mid-1980s, which I think was probably a seminal experience for most of us in the room who were old enough to remember that far back. Uh, and there were a couple of more uh, famines in, in uh, southern Sudan that I'm sure Luca could tell us about in the late 1980s and early 1990s, late 1990s, and a localized famine in eastern Ethiopia in, in 1999-2000. And then, at least by the way we currently define famines, they disappeared for about 10 years. And as Alex noted, we did kind of forget about them. Um, then uh, in 2011, uh, they came back with a vengeance in Somalia, but it wasn't quite clear whether that was a one-off uh, sort of freak occurrence or it really meant the return of famine. Uh, unfortunately, we now know it was the latter. But famine has declined dramatically in the last half century. This is actually Alex's slide, not mine. But what it depicts is the uh, level of famine mortality by decade over time from the late uh, 19th century until uh, the end of the 2000s. And uh, you could say a lot about this, this figure, but um, including the geographic location uh, of famine, which has predominantly been in Europe and Asia, even though I think many of us um, wrongly associate famine with, with Africa in, in, the, uh, in the current context. But the main point is you, you can see in the last 50 years a dramatic decline in both the incidence and the magnitude of, of famine. Um, and then um, we get to the present. And last year there were four countries on the famine risk uh, sort of watch list. That was northeastern Nigeria, um, southern Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. Um, more recently, we've been a little bit concerned about things going on in eastern Ethiopia and are watching uh, with some trepidation about developments in the Democratic Republic of Congo, too. In 2015, FuseNet noted something like 47 million people requiring, urgently requiring emergency food assistance globally. That went up to 69 million in 2016. 83 million last year, and it's dropped only slightly to the high 70 millions figure um, today, with something like um, 4.5 million people at immediate risk of famine a year ago, and, and maybe 4.1 million now. So the situation is maybe slightly better now than it was a year ago, uh, but also maybe slightly broader, and maybe um, something still that we're all quite concerned about. But before we go too much farther, maybe it's worth saying what is famine. I think we all have mental pictures of what famine is, but it may be worth for a moment to just reflect on what we mean by that. Mary Fitzpatrick and I defined it like this in an article for Oxford Bibliography Online in 2012. Famine is generally described as an extreme crisis of access to adequate food manifested in widespread malnutrition and loss of life. And it may be driven by both natural and man-made causes. The actual technical definition by which we define famine today is, is, is very technical. It's based on uh, thresholds in three different indicators, one of which is food insecurity, one of which is malnutrition, and one of which is the crude rate of mortality, such that if we find in a given population at a given time, more than 20% of households have literally no access to food, more than 30% of children are acutely malnourished, and the crude mortality rate is greater than two people per 10,000 per day, that's what we call a famine. And the minimum sized population, for that to, to be occurring in is like 10,000 people. So it's a very, uh, it, it's, it's a very kind of dry uh, and technical definition, but it belies a lot of things behind it that I hope we will, that we will dig into in the course of the day today. Let's start with Somalia in 2011. Um, on July 20th, 2011, the United Nations declared a famine in Somalia. We all knew it was coming. It wasn't a surprise. It, the, the early warning uh, people had been screaming bloody murder for, for months. But it was, it was a, a crisis that we were very slow to react to. By the time they finally declared the crisis, you can see some of the figures here. Four million people uh, affected, 750,000 people actually in famine, nearly half a million children malnourished, uh, and a lot of new displacement, both internally and across the borders in Kenya and Ethiopia. And to the right there, you see the kinds of uh, mapping protocols that we use to map food insecurity these days. And the purple color there indicates the area that was in famine. And this is one of the few maps you'll see that actually has that purple color on. Uh, 
It's worth noting, though, that what happened in Somalia wasn't the result of any particular single thing. There was an underlying uh, ongoing livelihoods crisis that had been happening since, really since the collapse of the formal state in the, in the early 1990s, and uh, along with that, a kind of an environmental crisis that affected much of the, of the country. There was ongoing conflict between um, an armed non-state group called al-Shabaab and the fledgling transitional federal government of Somalia, along with its Africa Union um, um, allies. There was, to be sure, a major drought, one of the most severe droughts to hit uh, East Africa in recent years that had an, a big impact on both agricultural production and livestock, and therefore the livelihoods of people who depended on um, anything uh, rain-fed, both agriculture and livestock. Independent of the production shock from the drought, there was a global spike in the price of food at the time. This was the spring of 2011. You may recall some association of global price spikes in food also being one of the fuels that, that drove the uh, so-called Arab Spring. But in a country like Somalia that, imp that imports 80% of its food even in a good year, and needless to say this was a bad year, um, a global tripling of the price of, of basic foodstuffs uh, had, an, had an amazing knock-on effect domestically. But actually, it was the, it was the late response. It was the, it was the inability of either the government, which was almost non-existent at the time, or the international community to respond in time to the crisis that really tipped the whole thing over into famine. So there is a, a number of different causes. Alex uses the, the, the image of a rogue wave or, or a kind of a vortex. It wasn't like there was one thing that caused this. It was the coming together of multiple different things that actually resulted in a famine. Now, there was a lot of worries that we were back in this situation with Somalia a year ago. Uh, the indicators looked about the same. Uh, there was another serious drought going on. However, there was a more, uh, a more functional government in place, and there was a lot more uh, robust and timely response from the International Committee. Whether or not that actually averted a famine, of course, we can't say for sure because there's no counterfactual to compare it against, but there was not a famine in Somalia last year. I think that there's a lot of um, <clears throat> misunderstandings, some sort of perhaps incomplete explanations, and then some things we don't want to talk about when it comes to the drivers of famine. We often think of famines in terms of shortages of food, but I think we've pretty well gotten that idea beyond our, our uh, consciousness in terms of the drivers of famine. There may be food shortages. There was a production shock in Somalia in 2011, and it did decrease the amount of food available locally uh, on some markets. There is also this question about overpopulation, and I'll show you another slide in just a second to try and uh, dispel that myth. Production shocks, um, often caused by climatic factors, certainly are uh, one of the drivers of famine. Uh, perhaps we would phrase this more in terms of climate change, and I'll leave that to Bill to discuss uh, in a little bit. There are certainly market shocks that result in the collapse of what Amartya Sen taught us to refer to as entitlements, or the the access to food that people have through the means of, of production or labor that they have themselves. But then there's a number of things that are sort of elephants in the room that we don't like to talk about. Virtually every contemporary famine is associated with violent conflict, often with failures of government, frequently with various forms uh, of social breakdown. And as our book on, on uh, Somalia tries to make the case, competing imperatives. In, in Somalia in 2011, there was a security imperative around containing uh, al-Shabaab competing with the humanitarian imperative of responding to the famine. And to be frank, the, the security imperative won out until the famine was declared, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Just to dispel the, um, the, the uh, link between population growth and famine, uh, this is another one of Alex's slides. Thank you, Alex. I'm using lots of your slides this morning. Um, <clears throat> You could have perhaps drawn some kind of parallel between population growth and, and the occurrence of famine in the first part of the 20th century, but actually all those famines were driven either by war or by sort of totalitarian uh, social engineering, not by, not by population or production shocks. And since the 1960s, or in other words for the last half century, a clear uh, negative correlation between population growth and the occurrence of famine or mortality from famine. So then, what are the, uh, the drivers of famine? If you look across all six of those countries that I just put up there a few slides ago, the common factor is conflict. All four of the countries that were at famine risk last year were in some kind of civil conflict. The area of eastern Ethiopia that we're now concerned about has been in a low-grade uh, kind of conflict for a number of years. 
And the fears about the Democratic Republic of Congo are entirely driven by the emergence of, of new conflict or the continuation of old ones. In Somalia and in northeastern Nigeria, we have armed non-state actors that have been labeled terrorists by the international community, and therefore um, anything to do with negotiating access with those groups or, God forbid, having aid go astray and end up in their hands uh, is a huge no-no, and in fact, that was one of the reasons for the late response to Somalia in 2011. In Yemen, uh, there are also groups that are called terrorists, but there is a sort of a regional superpower struggle going on that has uh, religious or sectarian overtones to it, um, involvement from uh, not only regional superpowers, but also the United States and other global superpowers and one in which uh, a naval blockade is one of the factors driving uh, lack of access to food and therefore the risk of famine. In South Sudan, we have seen uh, the licensing of, of the looting of people's livelihood assets, their land, in lieu of being able to pay for the, the costs of maintaining uh, an army or an armed forces. Maybe, maybe Luca will have more to say about that. There's no group in South Sudan that has been labeled a terrorist group, but I dare say people who are being victimized or as terrified by armed groups in South Sudan as they are in Somalia or in Nigeria. All of this amounts to extreme difficulties in, in accessing populations that are affected by these crises. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the restrictions that donors have on aid going astray. In Nigeria, there is a sense that the humanitarian aid effort is actually sort of part and parcel of a counterinsurgency strategy and a lot of, a lot of soul searching about what to do under those circumstances. And we've seen the use of food as a weapon or famine and crimes occurring in some of these contexts as well. Just to try and draw the link between conflict and famine risk, I'd like to show you a couple of charts here. N never mind the details, I am aggregating the, uh, what, what we call integrated phase classification, which is what that map of Somalia was depicting, uh, which is, which, uh, is assessed. This, this is data from South Sudan. It's assessed at the county level. I'm aggregating it to the state level or the, or the former states in South Sudan. And the, the takeaway message here is that the higher the phase classification, the more severe the food insecurity and therefore the greater risk of famine. And what I'd just like to show you is where the conflict be, uh, broke out in Juba in uh, late 2013 and quickly spread to Greater Upper Nile. Th these three lines here represent the, the, the three main states in Greater Upper Nile. And you can see the direct impact on food security that the onset of the conflict had there. This is Greater Bar al-Ghazal, the north, northwestern part of South Sudan, uh, with the same data being depicted. And again, that's where the conflict either began in uh, western Bar al-Ghazal or began to affect market <coughs> access and other things in, in northern Bar al-Ghazal, even though there wasn't actual fighting there. And again, you can see the dramatic impact that it has on food security status. And this is the Equatorias, which is the southern part of South Sudan, and the so-called breadbasket of South Sudan. And as you can see, many of the areas there were at phase one in the IPC phase classification, which means no food insecurity for a number of years uh, until that area began being affected by conflict as well, which happened right there in, in uh, 2015. So the connection, I mean, this is sort of a crude uh, way of depicting it, but the connection between uh, conflict and famine, I hope, is, is, is quite clear from these pictures. I did want to talk briefly about market shocks. This is data from Somalia in 2011, and it depicts the terms of trade between casual labor and, gra and, and grain. So what people have to sell in comparison with the cost of the food that they must buy. And as you can see out here in, is this a, is this a pointy thing here? Never mind. As you can see out here in, in 2010, the terms of trade between labor and, and, uh, and grain were kind of bouncing around. They were different in different regions. But in the autumn of 2010, the, the amount of food that you can buy for a day's labor of, of, of casual labor goes over a cliff and remains extremely low for a long period of time, such that in, in, in some cases, you could buy about one-fifth as much food with what you had to sell, which was your labor, in, in mid-2011 than you could in, in mid-2010. And the, the famine was declared right at that point in July of 2011, and then thereafter, the price of grain globally began to drop with the return of the rains in, in the autumn of 2011. There was increased demand for labor, et cetera. So the terms of trade rapidly began to, to increase again. But that, but, but that dip and that long 
sorry, that long period of, of uh, depressed terms of trade was really one of the things that, that drove uh, the situation to famine. I also wanted to depict the notion of response failure so we know what we're talking about. This, this depicts uh, Somalia also in 2011. The green line here shows the level of funding committed to the consolidated appeals process or the UN's mechanism for raising funds for uh, response. The blue line shows the number of people receiving any kind of food assistance, and the red line shows uh, excess mortality resulting from the famine. And you can see what happened when the famine was declared in, 2000, in, in July. Overnight, literally overnight, the, the, the level of funding doubled and eventually tripled. The number of people that were receiving some kind of food assistance immediately took off. But by that point, mortality from the famine had already peaked and was actually beginning to decline. So that, that kind of depicts what we mean by, by uh, response failure. Just very briefly, there are some problems we have around analyzing and predicting problems. And as you can see from this previous slide, obviously the impact of a declaration is, is uh, dramatic. Without that declaration, there probably would not have been that kind of a response. But declarations are by definition late. If you're declaring a famine, a famine is already going on. The, the, the point is to find out about it and respond to it before it is, is going on. And a lack of information usually isn't the problem. There are problems with, with actually determining a famine. Uh, with conflict as a driver, it's often very difficult to get access to the places that you need to, to assess to see what's happening. But the real issue is the link to response, and especially to early response. And there are a lot of political constraints that I think some of my fellow panelists will go into. In terms of technical challenges, we have seen repeated um, issues with the timeliness of information, the completeness of information, the representativeness of data. And it's often, it's often difficult to tell whether all three of those uh, thresholds that I mentioned have been breached simultaneously or not. And therefore, it's often very difficult to say very much about, about what's actually happening on the ground in real time. These are difficult circumstances to work in, so we see a high uh, turnover of staff and often technical capacity issues. There are often not national early warning systems, so we rely on, on um, international systems. And we have this problem of, of, as I sort of hinted, early warning but, but late response. In other words, we know what's happening, but we don't respond until we actually see it with the whites of our eyes. And a couple of the reasons for this that I'm sure Luca will expand on uh, in greater detail. First of all, famine is highly political. Uh, we have taken for good reason to referring to famine as the F word. Uh, it's, it's equally as shocking. And it's something that nobody wants to hear about on their watch. No government wants to admit that it's happened. No, no humanitarian agency who's responsible for, for protecting people wants to hear that. Uh, so we see all kinds of different messaging around famine without actually saying the word without actually being clear of it. There are major constraints to real-time analysis. There are very high uh, bars for the, the, the rigor, uh, the representativeness, and the timeliness of the data that are often not met. And what that means is we've gotten ourselves into a situation where it's very difficult to declare a famine if one is not actually happening. We, we, we rarely have the, the, the error of a false negative because the, the, the levels of, of rigor required in those indicators are so high. But because they're so high, and because of the data problems, we have relatively few protections against the opposite problem, which is that of, of false negatives, or failing to declare a famine when one may actually be, be happening. So these are all some of the challenges that we face. Uh, I think I have probably overstayed my welcome, so I will uh, uh, let Bill carry on. Yeah, Sorry? Yeah, I'm for 10 minutes. OK. So anyway, uh, the, the, I hope that sets a little bit of the context, and I hope that Luca and Bill will uh, provide some greater detail. Thank you very much.